Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to resume this study on Judges chapter 15. And uh, before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the blessings that we have received from your hand in this study in this week. And uh, we ask for your continued presence in our lives and um, in our study of your word. We're thankful that we can be here to study together. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Can you, we ask that we can have clear minds and that we can retain the things that we are studying and that we can share them with others. We pray for this movement and uh, the implications of the study uh, for us individually and for this movement in general, we ask Lord that um, we can understand these things so that we can act correctly in accordance with thy will and that we can follow thee. Be with us now as we open your word together, we pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again. Um, I watched over uh, the video uh, that we had addressed uh, the foxes when we were first studying this in Judges 15. And uh, so this, what we had talked about yesterday, happened to be uh, study number 187, which was kind of interesting. Um, so everybody was saying the same thing. So Dwight said the same thing that he said back then. Angela said the same thing. Stephen said the same thing, referred to the same verses. I was saying the same thing. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. We, have, we haven't changed much. And um, But what we're doing right now is, is placing this upon a line. So we have some more context. And what we weren't doing there is we weren't trying to find the time. And we were, we were still struggling with uh, a little bit more about the ironic nature of the story of Samson. We weren't quite sure then how to address that. Now, are, are we agreed that, that it's just the moral aspects of the story that are ironic? Do we understand what I mean by that? Isn't that part of what we've been working to, to really cement in place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if that's the case, when we when we look at the three hundred foxes, we can see that the foxes are referring to a false prophet. We don't we don't flip that around um, here because the symbol itself is not ironic, right? understand what i'm saying anybody not understand continue with your point well it's just that originally we were having trouble with that we were having trouble trying to understand um the ironic nature so if false foxes are representing false prophets a tail represents you know a false prophet right and we have these two tails tail to tail um, and Rosanna had asked in that study is that like um, uh, two false messages or something like that, because these are liars, right? The, uh, the prophet that tells lies, he's the tail, right? So, so we are just having troubles trying to deal with that. We know that the firebrand, this torch represents, uh, we can see this in the story of Gideon, right? Um, with the 300 but here we would have to say that this is just a counterfeit, right? We're not going to have this then represent Gideon, right? What the same things that Gideon represents. This is a counterfeit to Gideon's 300, right? Because all the symbols here, we're just taking them as symbols and we're not flipping them around, right? So... 
now we, we see this chiasm. Now, when I think about this chiasm here, because this is a chiasm of the false prophet, um, I'm going to end up drawing this out here. I, I don't really know how to explain it otherwise. Okay, can you hear me okay? You're coming through all right. So we know this is this uh, 1260, 1260 which is the 2520 of Christ's. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so when we have these foxes, now there's 300 of them, but they're, they're in pairs. And so the one pair, and so I, I don't think that the symbol of 300, that we have to have 300 different chiasms. We just have this idea of a chiasm and, but they're tied tail to tail. So we know that if we do this counterfeit, that's wrong. There you go. It still looks wrong, but <laughs> um, But we know we have paganism and papalism. Right? Now, are these foxes? We could say that, yes. Okay. So, so there's the true. Now, the thing that I don't know, like we have this 300 as a symbol. So we know that the 300, um, Gideon's 300. So just write it here as a question, how this relates to what we're seeing here, right? So I just want people to think about it because <clears throat> because I don't I don't have an answer. It's just I know that what we're seeing is a counterfeit, and this counterfeit of this chiasm to me is this primary chiasm. That's the counterfeit is the twenty five twenty for northern Israel, right? Northern Israel is the false prophet, right? I mean. We've been saying this for years. And so 1798 is the rise of the false prophet, the United States. So, so we can see that all these symbols here are this symbol of the 2520 for Northern Israel. Now, we have this in the context of Samson, who is Christ. He's the true. So Samson is okay. So I have to read this here. What's there? I'll, I'll come back to that. Whatever Angela wrote there. One is she writes cryptically, so I can never remember understand what she's writing. But anyway, um, so Christ is the true so samson is the true even though morally he's ironic but 
in this context, once we interpret the symbols, this 300 is this counterfeit. So we know that the 300 in Gideon is this presentation of July 18. And, and the thing that I'm struggling with here is we see this counterfeit. And we're going to place this counterfeit. Um, here. So this is what we did yesterday, whether we understand it or not yet. Uh, we placed the 300 foxes on the first day of the 10th month. Right? So that's where we have. Them. And we have it whoops, after Pentecost. Pentecost being these, these messages these first fruit messages of Dwight's and of Dilio's. And so this is what we did. And we, and we have these two symbols, the December 25th, 2022 symbol and the January 11th, 2023 symbol. You right. mean uh, Col Col Collins and Odilio's? Yeah. yeah, Colin, what did I say? Dwight's and Odilio's. Oh, so pardon. <laughs> yeah, Collins and Odilio's, right? And also Stephen had a message on December 25th 2021, which was the 777 years. But we're not counting it as one of the messages because whether Stephen wants to admit it or not, he's a part of this study. <laughs> and, and he was confirming what we had understood about December 25th, 2021, in all of the studies that were leading up to it. So um, his, his, revelation that he had there on that day um, confirmed what we had been saying about December 25th, 2021. And, and then Collins study um, and then followed 49 days later, seven weeks by Odilio's study um, becomes this, this message, which we're going to call the two lows, right? So that's how we're going to describe it. It's the first fruits offering at Pentecost. And this is going to be Samson, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, where he has Pentecost. And, and it's been confirmed, like I've looked through lots of different commentaries, and it's well recognized that it's actually on Pentecost that, that Samson goes to see his wife with this kid of the goats, right? So they, they all recognize that that's the start of wheat harvest, um, not, you know, somewhere in the time of wheat harvest. It's actually the time of wheat harvest, which is Pentecost. And, and then we have these 300 foxes. So we know that this is a message of the false prophets. Now, but it also occurs with this symbol of the first day of the 10th month, right? That, at least that's where I've placed it whether that's the correct way, place to place it, I don't know, but that's where we placed it. Now, if there's a counterfeit message, right, because this is 300 foxes would represent the false prophet, the message of the false prophet, what would that mean? Can people just brainstorm a little bit about this? And try not to be shy about it. But just, you know, whatever you think that, you, you know, might be possible. Just based upon the symbols that we have. Now, the other symbol we have for the first day of the 10th month, whether this helps us or not is Noah's going to see the tops of the mountains. Uh, so what do the mountains symbolize? Yeah, just, just another thought about the first day of the 10th month. Okay. Um, the 777 days, um, if you line them up with the 777 years from 457, to uh, 321, 
Yeah. The uh, the forty nine years would uh, if you line that up, um, beginning to be typifying the, the forty nine days from uh, November 9, 2019, would take you to the 28th of December, 2019. And that's the 10th day of the first month. Sorry, first day of the 10th month. The first day of the 10th month. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then uh, I find out also that the cross would line up with the 25th day of the 12th month. I think it's like uh, 2020, I think it's like March or so, or 2021. I think it works out to be around the 9th of March, 2021. So I thought that was interesting that you got there the 25th day of the 12th month, lining up with the cross, and you parallel uh, them okay. uh, 777 days of the 777 years. Okay, so I'm going to draw this out. Uh... Okay, so we, we got a line here, so you got to give me the dates. And oh, I put the, the wrong camera. There we go. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> so what are we doing? Okay, uh, 457 to 321, 777 years. Right, so we go here, we got 321. And okay, so we, then we got 49 years at the beginning. Yeah, which brings us to 408. Yeah. And then we have uh, 434 years. Yeah. Seven years with a cross in between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so on the next line underneath, November 9. December 25th, 2021. So this is going to be December 25th, 2021? No, 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 the end, the end of it. Oh, okay. So you've got 777 years and 777 days. Okay. Right, yeah, so we got 777. Either way, okay. So this is about why we're starting here, because we're counting these 777 days. And then you're going to put 49... So that's yeah, so that comes to the, the first day of the 10th month. On the biblical calendar? Yes. I think it's like 28th of December. Okay, so the 28th of December. 2019, of course. Yeah. Okay, and then the 434 days takes you, I think, it's to the 6th of March. And, of course, that would be... That would be the 22nd day of the 12th month in the biblical calendar. Yeah, but it's also um, sixth day of the third month. Yes. Okay. And then it's going to... So the, be, so the cross... Be. Yeah, you, you, you were like three and a half. It would take you to noon. So sort of midday, 25th of December. Or 25th of... 25th day of the 12th month. Okay, so this one's the 25th day of the 12th month? The, the cross, where the cross lines up. Okay, so this is the 25th day of the 12th month. So that would be the 9th of March. Okay, um, so this is the 22nd day. Okay, so we we'll just put this, so that's March 9th. Okay, and then... Uh, the last one would be the 29th day of the 12th month. Okay, that's going to be March 13th. Yes. Uh, okay. So here it's just that we have December 25th is the cross date. Uh -huh. uh, as a symbol, it's not December 25th, it's March 9th, but. Yes. The, uh, the, med the med point of the 434 takes you. Uh, to the 11th day of the fifth month. So it's just one day after 
the 10th day of the fifth month, which was, so that was the 31st of July, if you remember, in 2020. So that was the, the other July 18, I think it was in the Julian date. Yeah, so that'd be, be as August, August 1st. Yeah, so August 1st would be the, the midpoint. July 19th, so August 1st, Gregorian, July 19th, Julian. You can maybe mark it as Pat, Ramp Pat Rampey's great disappointment. Because <laughs> he, he, he was sort of looking to extend it to till that date had passed, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so we got that. But it's close to the center of it. I mean, that's just one day off. Because that goes to the start of that day, right? Yes. So, I mean, you could just mark it as the end of that. You could. Right. So. Okay. so that's pretty interesting. Now, we're bringing this up because of these 49 days that we have here. Now, these, these 49 days... Um, That we have on this other chart. I mean, they're they're actually at the end. Like after you have this twenty five, the seven seven seven, you have forty nine days again, right? Is that yes. Okay. So what what would that mean? Just a repeat of history. Yeah, maybe like a could be or like a mer in some way. I'm not sure. Okay. Now, um, now if you count seven hundred and seventy-seven days after December twenty-fifth, twenty twenty-one, uh, you come to your birthday, February eleventh, twenty twenty-four. Right, if you go to the end of that, right, complete that December 25th, 2021. <clears throat> and then you'll be what, uh, 55 or something? Yes, uh, 55. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so you're turning 54 this year. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Okay. Um, whatever that means in, as far as that. So you haven't tried working out any structure with that, like what we did here, like repeating it again. No, I haven't, no. Okay. So I mean, we, we could try that. <clears throat> so so the 300 um, foxes, right? So we're, we're taking this as this counterfeit. So all I'm using the number 300 for here, because there are 300 foxes, is that this is a counterfeit of the message of July 18. Right, that's that's what we're we're saying. So is any other thoughts about why we have this counterfeit message and should we mark it on the first day of the 10th month? Should we do that? And um, and I drew that wrong there because that's going to be the first day of the tenth month. That's why you brought that up. I wrote it as first day of the first month. So so when we count forty nine days past November 9th, twenty nineteen, we come to December twenty eighth, twenty nineteen. And it's the first day of the 10th month. That's why you brought this up. 
because you've noticed this before, right? You've done this before. Yeah, I just noticed it the other day. I just, I think maybe, maybe yesterday, I think I've done it okay. or the day before. Now, the first day of the 10th month, because the law of first mansion uh, puts it in the story of Noah, right? We don't have a first day of the 10th month be before that. And the first day of the 10th month is the tops of the mountains appearing and I ask the question, what do mountains represent? And of course, if we look at Miller's rules, what does he say about mountains? Kingdoms. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go there and bring it up. Um, what he says, particularly. Um, let's see if I can it's gonna give this to me. Okay, now there's rules. Here we are somewhere here. It's gonna talk about mountains. Doesn't show me. Okay, there it is. Okay, figures always have a figurative meaning, so I'm gonna have to. Go there. So he says, figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times and events, such as mountains, meaning governments, right? Beast meaning kingdoms, waters meaning people, lamp meaning word of God, day meaning year, right? So Mountains meaning governments. But what I'm doing here is I'm making another application. That is, I'm saying that the tops of the mountains appearing refer to Miller's rules. Is that does that make sense? You understand what I'm getting at? Okay. No. Okay, so here we have the tops of the mountains appear. So let's let's go there. So that was Genesis eight. <clears throat> Because in this story, we have Noah on the ark, and we're going to have that the water is going to prevail, prevail for 150 days, right? And then the water is going to start uh, abating, right? So not going to go into all that idea. But here we have these 150 days. So what do we notice in the story of Noah about the 150 days? Is that 300 days, if you have the water prevail for 300 days and abate for 100, 150 days and abate for 150 days? That's 300, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So we have the symbol of 300 in the story of Noah. It's not often noted. That is, most people just think that the 150 days is the same period. Now, I have found other people who also recognize and have a lot of the same arguments that I have in recognizing that it's, it's, a, it's a biblical year of 385 days in order for this to fit, and that it's pretty clear that the 150 days uh, begin after the 40 days of rain, that the water prevails, that's where it's at its height, and then it's going to decrease, and when it decreases, that's going to be this, um, the water abating, right? And um, now in the story of Noah, so it, it, the water prevails, 300 cubits is the length of the ark. So, so, so you, you'll see what I mean answering this other question too. So the waters prevail from the third month, the 27th day to the eighth month, the 29th day. Um, so that's, and then, and then the, the ark after the waters begin to, um, um, so, so it's gonna be this period of time and it's 
near the end of that period of time, so it's going to be in the seventh month and the 17th day, that um, the ark rests on the mountains of Ararat. Now, my understanding there is not that it actually um, is um, like it's not drying up yet because it's still in the time that the water has, is prevailing. But the ark comes to rest in the mountains of Ararat. That is, it's now protected from what's going to happen as the waters abate, right? So the waters are then going to abate and they begin to abate on the, on the 30th day of the eighth month to the first day of the first month is this period of time the waters abate. Now the tops of the mountains appear on the, uh, the 10th month, the first day. So that's gonna be June 6th, uh, 2390 BC. Um, now this of course is in the years of Noah's life. It's not the biblical calendar months that are being uh, labeled. These are just the, in the 600th year of Noah's life on the first day of the 10th month, but we still have that symbol of the first day of the 10th month. Now, um, so that's going to occur. Um, so the waters abate starting on um, May 7th, and then the tops of the mountains appear on June 6th. So that's going to be 30 days later, right? So it's basically, well, the first day of the first uh, first month, first day. Let me see here. Where am I going? Eighth month, 30th day to uh, the 10th month, first day. So that, um, that ninth month only has 29 days. Anyway. So we can see the two periods of 150. We can see all these different symbols, but the tops of the mountains appear after the waters begin to abate 30 days later. So what are these symbols that are being given us here in the story of Noah? Because we're not gonna say that the mountains represent uh, governments in this context. Would you, would you say the waters represent people? No. No, that's not how we're, in, we're interpreting this story of Noah. Because this is a prophetic pattern. The story of Noah is giving us a structure. It's giving us a chiasm, right? So when we think about the chiasms, we, we think about, well, in the story of Abraham, right? The 215... Uh, years, the two periods of 215 years over a period of 430 years. But here in the story of Genesis chapter uh, 7 and 8, we also are given a chiasm, the first chiasm that I know of, um, if, you, if you take away the chiasm of the week, but itself. Um, but a, a structural chiasm here. And it's periods of 150 days over a period of 300 days, right? And, and it has all the classic things. There's, you know, the water prevailing and the water abating, right? So you have two separate things it's dividing this into. And, and we have from the time that the water abates, we have a symbol of 30 to when the tops of the mountains appear. Now I'm saying, that mountains represent, they bring us to Miller's rules, that it's a symbol, right? So the mountains are a symbol. And what we're seeing on the first day of the 10th month is a symbol, right? Something that, that Miller brings up as a symbol. And so I'm saying that this first day of the 10th month is a prophetic marker. That is, it gives us a symbol but it's related to, to this structural chiasm, that there is something that's understood on the first day of the 10th month, that it, it symbolizes an understanding of something. Uh, could I, um, like in Ezra, uh, I think it's 1016? Yeah. Is that the other one? Yeah. Should we be using them both together? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what well, I'm trying to Separation, say. so the waters could be a, a people, because there is a separation in 16. Yes, I see what you're saying. But in the story of Noah, what we're looking at is the symbols that are being used. And um, you, you would have to have something more than just that waters represent people um, and, and the waters, because the waters aren't really being separated here. Um, you just have the period that the waters prevail and the waters uh, um, then abate. And so you would have to explain what that, that would mean. Um, so I don't take in the story of Noah that the waters represent people. I, I mean, I don't know how to apply the whole story of the flood. Well, well could you could you um, apply it this way? Wouldn't the people sometimes cover up the um, Miller's rules? Okay, so if I'm going to take the story of Noah and the flood, I mean, this is this is a... I mean, it's just, just we have an actual literal story of something that happened, which is the destruction of humanity, except for God's people that are saved, right? So this is a story of deliverance. Now, we can put the story of Noah on a line, and, and I've attempted to do that. I've never done any presentations of it because I'm not really satisfied with anything that I've, I've looked at because it's, it's a rather complex narrative. It is a chiasm. It, it actually contains a literary chiasm in the way that the story is told. And it's, it's an actual mirror. You can mirror the verses together and lots of people have noticed this chiastic structure in it. Um, so, so it is a line, but in that line, I don't see that we can just take the normal symbols that we have later. Like we can't take waters to represent people. We can't take mountains to represent kingdoms unless we made some other application of it. Um, what I see that the story of Noah does is it gives us all of these symbols that later on are used prophetically. So there, there's just tons of symbols in the story of Noah, the weeks, the releasing of the doves, the raven, uh, you know, the very fact that the door of the ark closes. And see, that's the thing is the door of the ark closes on the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, because it's going to be October 22nd, 2391 BC, that the door of the ark closes. Um, and so this becomes a pattern for October 22nd, 1844, of course. So it's the 10th day of the seventh month, even though it's the, the 10th day of the second month in the, year, the 600th year of Noah's life, it's actually the seventh month. And, you know, I worked this out by using um, the full moon as the marker for uh, the 15th day of the month. So there was a lot of work in, involved in, in sorting that out, the chronology of it. But so many things fell into place. One is the periods of time and how they lined up with the months. Um, only worked, I could only have it work out one way. So in, in 2390 BC, going from the fall of 2391 to the fall of 2390. Um, so, so I don't know if I would do that, but I can say that the 10th day, uh, the first day of the 10th month in this story of Ezra, I mean, what's being separated here is not just people. What's being separated Truth, maybe? Okay. Truth. Well, we understand this is having to do with, with Miller's rules, right? Because they're being separated from the strange wives. And the strange wives here are a symbol of false, like the Protestant understanding of how to study the scriptures. So in the story of Noah is illustrated chronology right really for the first time we have a day and a month given to us right we don't have a day and a month given to us anywhere else in in the book of genesis uh, 
up to that point, right? We don't have, it doesn't tell us what day of the month, you know, that the world was created or anything like that. Um, what day of the month an event occurs. But there in the story of the flood, we have the days in the month given in the 600th year of Noah's life, all the way up to the 601st year. So, so you, do you see what I'm saying? How the, the story of Noah is giving us all of these symbols that relate to biblical chronology and that relate to the interpretation of prophecy, that the story of Noah is giving us Miller's rules. Can you see that? Or am I just too abstract here? Well, in Noah, it does say they have visibility now. Right, they, and, they, and yeah. a, a sign of hope. Right. Yeah. So, but everything in this story is all about prophetic symbols, right? That's, you know, it's you, you look at the top of the mountain, you can see the top of the mountain, you can now see prophecy, right? Not all of it, you can just see the top of the mountain. But that first day of the 10th month, is Miller's rules being understood in contrast to what we see the strange wives in the story of Ezra? Right, so the tops of the mountains being seen on the first day of the 10th month, this is us seeing something. But in Ezra, they're resolving the problems. They're sitting down to examine it. Right, which is what we're doing, right? We're separating the precious from the vile. But this is done with Miller's rules. And, and so they're being illustrated here. Um, in this symbol of the 300. Right. So the reason why we're there, well, I guess kind of for two reasons. We're there because of the symbol of the 300. And we're there because in our line, we have the first day of the 10th month in connection with the 300. Right. So, you know, so we got there without, because I wasn't originally thinking about, you know, the 300 days. But, but it is about a chiasm. So we've addressed the chiasm. Now we're looking at the 300 days. We can see in the story of Noah, there's 300 days divided into 150 and 150. Um, and we'd already put the 300 foxes on the first day of the 10th month. So we go to the first day of the 10th month. We're going to see that that's going to be 30 days after the center of this chiasm, right? So once the water begins to abate, you're going to have the first day of the 10th month, 30 days later. Okay, an odd question. Okay. With all this that we're dealing with, with 300, mm -hmm. does this lend or is support lent to this with the 300 by when the tabernacle was set up at Shiloh and then when the tabernacle was removed from Shiloh. Yeah. So you're talking about the 300 years. Yes. Right. So, yeah. So, so we, we, we already spent a lot of time uh, connecting the 300 with that. Um, mostly when we were looking at the 300 years themselves, but we would have to say yes. So, so we still have to kind of delve into that a bit more. But now you can start to see what I'm talking about with this 300. That, it, that this is the counterfeit 300. And, and you can see, because remember, there's two periods of 300 years, right? Just like there's two 2520s. Agreed. And they start and begin how many years apart? Stephen. Sorry, say that again. 
So there, you have two periods of 300 years and they're staggered. They start how many years apart? 300 years. Um, yeah, but how many years at the beginning? Yeah, so the beginning is one period of 300 years starts and the other one starts. How many years apart is it from when they, they start? Well, there's, are you talking about the 300 years from 977 to Massa? In, in Capra, or, yeah. If that's the period that, that theater is referring to, wouldn't that have been 210 years? In between? From the end of, yeah, from the end of the 300, yes. Right. Is that what you're referring to, Theodore? No, the other periods of 300 years. The, the, All right, the okay, that's the one. All right, okay, there's seven years coming in. Then. Right, okay. So, so we have the seven years that, that staggers these two periods of 300 years, right? So that, so when we looked at those, we can see that they, they um, in a sense, parallel, the 20, 225-20s, right? In a way, yes. For yeah, and one, and one deals with the sanctuary, right? So kind of, in a sense, parallel to the 2300 days, but, and the other deals with <laughs> with what? Well, since they came to the, the territory from the Amorites. Okay, so so how could we characterize that? Like what? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure either. Um, but it, you know, it has to mean something. So so anyway, you have these two, these two three hundred year periods that are staggered by seven years. And so you can see that their relationship to the seven times of the 225-20s is, is there. And we can see that, because um, we're talking here about the 300 foxes, and these are going to parallel the 300 of Gideon, right, as symbols. They're not, they're not spans of time, but they still parallel each other, right? One's a counterfeit and one's a true. Dwight, you have a thought? No, I'm just, I'm just sitting here thinking, that's all. Okay. I mean, you've also, you, you've got that. There, there's another period of 300 years prior to the tabernacle being set up at Shiloh that deals with uh, Jacob. Yeah. So, and that period of 300 years goes from? I think it's from the birth of Joseph. So right. The birth of Joseph to? to the the yeah, the setting up of the tabernacle. Right, so there's two 300 year periods staggered one out, like one connected to the other or, or no. So the setting up of the tabernacle, that's, that's back, not gonna- Back to back, back yeah. to back. Yeah, so, so back- the setting up of the tabernacle, that would be the midpoint, would be the setting up of the tabernacle. Yeah, the setting up of the tabernacle at Shiloh. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you got 300, 300 there. Um, so again, that's going to give us a chiasm dealing with 300. Of course, it's going to be 600 years altogether. So, so we have these 300s. And so, so what does 300 represent in and of itself as, as a symbol?
I mean, because this we we first get this at least as far as um, structurally we get this in the story of of Noah the flood. Well, uh, let's get in. We had connected 300 there to 144,000. Okay, so to 144,000, this is, so it's it's really relates to victory to some degree, right? I mean, that's how I always thought of it, but because they're gonna have this victory. Okay, anything else above 300? And we know that um, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. Right. So that's 65 and 300 together. Right. Because it's going to be 65 when he has Methuselah and then 300 years that he lives. So he lives 365 years. Is, is that relevant at all? I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we can set it aside. I would agree with Stephen. Yeah, okay. Now, another symbol we have is the 300 pieces of silver in Genesis 45, 22. That, uh, Benjamin got 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. So we can see here the symbol of the foolish and the wise, the five. I'm just looking at all these different 300s. So, of course, in the story of Gideon, we got the 300. They're going to con conquer the Midianites. 300 foxes. And we have um, the, the spear of... Um, in 1 Samuel 21, 16, when David fought against uh, so Ish Bibin, uh, Bibinab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of brass. Um, so I don't know if that's really relevant. 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 <laughs> um, but we looked at the shields before, right? The 300 shields of gold, and they're going to be replaced with 300 shields of brass. Could that be you have 300 of gold and the ones of brass then are counterfeits? I think we'd have to look at that point a little deeper. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anyway, we have all of these these symbols of three hundred. Um, so. <clears throat> And now we have, so we've placed them with these 300 foxes. So what we can say is that 300 in and of itself is not a positive or a negative number. It's just, it's just a number that, that symbolizes in prophecy. We first get it in Genesis with the flood. But now we have these 300 foxes and, and we can say that foxes are false prophets. And so this is going to relate to um, the 2520s, the, two, the counterfeit and the true uh, covenant, right? So it's the counterfeit covenant is, and the, the true covenant is Christ's weak. But we also have the 2520 for Judah, right? And now we have this first day of the 10th month. And we put the 300 foxes here. Can we establish that the 300 foxes go here on this symbol of the first day of the 10th month? So we're placing this in our history. Um, on a date that has just passed, December 25th, 2022, which is the first day of the 10th month. And though that's tied with January 11th from the symbols in Ezra dealing with the first day of the 10th month. So both of these are the first day of the 10th month as a symbol. All right. Now, they're 18 days apart, whatever that means. But um, but this is, this is what we're doing. We're trying to take this story of Samson, place it on a line. And so if he's going to be taking these foxes, putting them into a chiasm and lighting their tails on fire, what is it that's being told us that's happening in our time right now that we're kind of in the middle of? I mean, we're seven days away from January 11th. So, but we passed December 25th already and we, we noted what occurred there was us joining again with uh, what we joined on the 24th. And then on the 25th, we had invited them to this, to this study. Yeah. And then the question there was about uh, the biblical date yeah, so the first day of the 10th month is December 25th, 2022, right? So that's why we have that first day of the 10th month there. But we had already established it symbolically The January 11th was the first day of the 10th month based upon uh, the story of Ezra and counting these months, the 88 days, to... Um, April 5th, 2030. And that was the end, of course, of Colin's prediction. And so we could take those 88 days, make them 88 prophetic months. It's 2,640 days from the end of January 11th, 2023 to the beginning of April 5th, 2030. And then we found we could do a similar thing by taking the 30-30-30 symbol, saying that that's three months, and then multiplying that by actual lunar months of 29.530587 days, and we get 18 days longer, and those 18 days longer bring us back to December 25th, 2022. So that's why it's the first day of the 10th month, both of these dates. 
So in this span of time, these 18 days, <clears throat> is the 300 foxes. Right, that's where we're marking it. And so we're, we're understanding that, that Judges 15 is continuing Judges 14, right? That's, that's how we came to understand it. So that when we look back here, right there, I have the calculations. So when we look back here, we had, we had, we had, you know, put Judges 14, 14 as December 25th, 2021. And we put February 12th, 2020 as a study with the 49 days there, you see down in the bottom corner. And then we put January 11th, 2023 and December 25th, 2022. So we're just taking this now on, on this and we're placing those three dates that we had there at the end, I guess four dates, five dates, whatever you wanna call them, one, two, three, four, five. And we're placing those dates on this line and saying that this is just the continuation of chapter 14, but is going to address the end of that wedding story where we're going to see that we have January 11th coming up and December 25th that's passed. And so this is symbolically representing what has been happening since December 25th, 2022, and, and it's continuing until January 11th, 2023. So it's very pertinent, pertinent that we understand this right now. And, and that the, you know, if if things go according to plan, January eleventh, twenty twenty three, will be uh, study number two hundred and sixty four, and then we count two thousand six hundred and forty days to April fifth, twenty thirty. So that wasn't planned. That's just how it happened. And so something is happening right now that we could characterize by Samson. So what is it? I mean, I mean, we really should want to know what this is telling us. And of course, God's going to show us. He's, we're right on the edge of that. But we want to do it correctly. We don't want to be rash about it. So what is this telling us? <clears throat> Colin and Odilio presented these studies over a year ago now. We had this year period of time to December 25th, 2022 from Colin's presentation in 2021. And, and we made this invitation to this meeting, which ended up being on December 25th. It wasn't really by design. I wanted to do stuff on December 24th, but God wasn't leading in that way. He led us to, to go to the upper room with the disciples and to participate in the studies there. And then the last study of the year, December 31st, uh, you know, Stephen's going to present uh, with, the, with the US group. And now we're moving towards January 11th. So what, what's happening? I mean, you guys must have some ideas. Well, if you look in Ezra 17, of the yeah. same chapter. Uh, chapter. It sounds like there's a resolve on the first day of the first month. Right. So what's going to happen is the first day of the first month is going to be the resolution, right? So that's why we count that 2,640 days from January 11th, or we could count the 2,658 days from December 25th. And that's going to bring us to the first day of the first month. And the first day of the first month is that date there at the end, April 5th, 2030. Now, we don't know what that means. This could merely just be a symbolic date, right? That is, we're not looking to 2030. It just symbolizes something. It's the fifth day of the fourth month. It's the first day of the first month, right? It's 30, you know, it's 2030, but it's a 30 in there. And so it may symbolize something, 
regarding this, this divorce, right? So we know that the divorce actually occurs over a period of 88 days. Um, Now, now, in my paper there that I just did uh, recently, I'm going to go there. Uh, I want, want to just um, clearly mark something here that I think is important in understanding this. So, Now, all the different light that came to us through the study of this um, period of the falling of the manna is quite amazing. But here you see a chart. Uh, this is uh, Grace Amadon. It's a Miss Amadon um, in the 1940s, an Adventist scholar who studied at the uh, um, University of Chicago, I believe is where she studied. And she publishes published papers in this... Uh, uh, the Journal of Biblical Literature. So she is an established um, peer-reviewed scholar. And these are the dates she gives for 457 BC. So you can see uh, the problem here. I mean, maybe you can't, maybe you can't yet, but we'll look at this problem, right? So she, um, so we know the Babylonians uh, kept the first day of the first month in 457 BC is March 27th, right? That's the symbol of the message to the Levites. Now, the Babylonians weren't um, very particular sometimes about how they started their calendar. That is, at this period of time, they they weren't following a metonic cycle. They weren't. They didn't have an um, a preordained calendar. Um, it was often kind of up to the king when he decided the year was going to start. Um, sometimes they would have a, a leap month at the beginning of the year. Sometimes they put it in the middle of the year. And um, now we know that Ezekiel, when he's using his calendar, he's using the Babylonian calendar. He's just taking the months and the dates that they have. Now, Ezra is in Babylon but he's going to Jerusalem and uh, he's going to use uh, the biblical calendar when he talks about his trip from Babylon to Jerusalem. So he would be aware that the Babylonians had begun the year on March 27th. Now, Miss Amadon, what she does is she starts the year on March 28th because March 27th would be before the equinox. And she recognizes that um, if, if it started on March 27th, if the month started on March 27th, you would need an extra month. So she knows this. So she, but what she has done is she doesn't begin with the first visible crescent. She uses the full moon um, and she does this in the time of Christ. Uh, she doesn't do it in 1844. I'm not sure why. Because if you do it in 1844, you get an October 23rd, 1844 date for the 10th day of the seventh month. But uh, people should read this paper to understand this a bit more fully. But the point is, if we were to follow uh, Grace Amadon's dates here, they would be one month earlier than the actual dates. And so from the 10th day of the first month, or the first day of the 10th month, which is the month Tibet, right? She puts it as Tibet, um, to the first of Nisan in her count would be four months, not three months, right? Because she's still going to have the year begin in April of 456. She's going to make that year that we count as 400, 354 days. She's going to make it 384 days. She's going to have it as a, a, what's called a common embolismic year. And that's wrong. And she has them bringing the gold and silver to the temple um, on the 
the Sunday because she doesn't want them doing it on a Saturday. So she makes this the fifth of Ab, where the Bible clearly says it's the fourth day that the silver and gold are brought to the temple. So the fourth day, because they arrive on the first day of the fifth month. So the fourth day is going to be the fourth day of the, of the fifth month, right? Right, it's going to be Av 4. So that's going to be a Sunday as well. But in the year previous, she has to move it over to get it to be a Sunday. I don't know if everybody fully understands this. But this is an important point, because what is the gold and silver? Do we run into gold and silver quite a bit in the Bible? And what is gold and silver? Just in its very basic sense. Maybe not its most basic, but. Medium of exchange. It's a medium of exchange. And how do they decide, decide about gold and silver? What do they have to do with it? Purify it. They have to purify it. Well, they have to purify it. So that's one thing. Both of them are purified and they're also weighed. And when they're weighed, they're being judged, right? Right. right? That's why it's in Daniel chapter five. You're going to have now weighed in the balances and found wanting, right? So gold and silver always has to be weighed. It also has to be purified, right? So if it's not purified, would, would gold and silver pass the test of weighing? No. Right? Because they, they also know that, you know, you could mix other things in with it and it wouldn't weigh the right amount for the volume that it has. So, so gold and silver, silver has to be purified, but it's also weighed and judged. Are God's people purified and weighed and judged? Yes. Okay. Now, also, is truth, God's word, purified? Yes, it is. And how many times? Seven. Seven times, right? Yeah, wh where's that verse? It's in uh, Proverbs or something like that. Maybe it's Psalms. Can't remember. Okay, right. So that is in Psalms. Psalm six. Psalms twelve six, right? So I'm just going to go there. So Psalms twelve six. I mean, this is pretty profound stuff. I'm, you know, uh, that what we're, what we're seeing here. So the words of the Lord are pure words, silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. In a Psalm 126 or, or 126, 126, Psalms 12, verse 6, right? Would now also be the 25 point. Well, yes. Okay. So, so you see the significance of all of these things that we're looking at. We're, we're looking at this gold and silver. We're looking at the story of Ezra that deals with this gold and silver. And, and we're looking at how these, not only do they have this gold and silver that's going to be brought to the temple, that's going to be divided among 12 of the priests, if I remember correctly, uh, when they begin their wait there at the river Ahava, their fast of three days. And then at the end of this story, you're going to have a call to Jerusalem within three days. And then you're going to have three months in which to divide the precious and the vile, to purify the gold and the silver, right? The, you know, the divorce. This is the study of God's word. So if we're going to look at 
at this line again, and we see that these 300 foxes are let, let loose in this field, uh, the fields of wheat, of the fields of the Philistines, right? So this is going to burn up their vineyards and their olive yards. I mean, on a simple, simple way of looking at, we could say that God is, you know, if we were just going to take this literally, um, I mean, basically, there's a bit over seven years in which, um, what, 2,640 days from January 11th, 2023, in which this divorce takes place. Now, that seems like a long time. That's why I don't really like to look at April 5th, 2030 as an actual date where something is going to happen. I look at it more symbolically. And But this date has been given to us right, from the week of Christ and all, all these other different ways. So is this movement going to be addressing this? Like Samson's is this message of July 18th, but he, he encompasses a bit more than that, right? As we can see, because his message now is this message of the 300 foxes that he lets loose. Right, so he's he's using this symbol. Uh, I, I mean, I don't fully understand it yet. So, you know, this is this is a, an interesting puzzle, but it's an important one. It's not just something for intellectual, um, you know, entertainment. It's something that that's quite important. And and. Yes, the, First day in the first month, always April 5th? No, it's a different, it's a different day every year. I mean, there's 30 different days that can be the first day of the first month. So in 1844, it was April 19th, right? That's because the Jewish year is um, 353, 354, 355, or 383, 384, or 385 days in length. So there's six, six different lengths of a year you can have. Uh, three of them have 13 months and three of them have 12 months. And, and so you're going to have it on a different date every year. What, what is it in 23? So in 2023, 20, so it's a good question. Well, it's just three months from December 25th, and that's going to be March 23rd. It's going to be a Thursday, March 23rd. It's the first day of the first month on the biblical calendar. Hey, Theodore, is it um, 2520 days between J January 11th, 2023 to 2030? From which? I mean, from January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. Is it tw 25, 20 days? No, it's 2,640 days. Well, it's seven years between, between them, two, them two dates, all right? Well, January 11th to April 5th. Yeah, it's, it's seven years, right? About seven years and uh, three three months, right? So it's uh, – and seven years is is more than uh, 2,000 – 25, 20 days because that would just be months of uh, – years of 360 days. So you would be um, 35 days every seven years. Okay. <clears throat> a bit more than that, 30, 37, 36. <clears throat> May 12th, 2030 is 25-20 days to April 5th, 2030, Iran says. So <clears throat> so 
So anyway, we have these three months. So, I mean, whether it's going to take that long for this movement to get its act together, um, I don't know. But that's what we have here. Um, so, you know, we could look at, well, maybe it's going to be March 23rd this year, right? That we're just going to take that April 5th, 2030 is the symbolic date that's given to us and that it's not not an actual date of what we're talking about in this application of the lines. It just gives us an anchor point. But we don't know, right? But have the foxes had their tails tied together and have they been set loose in the fields starting on December 25th, 2022, going to January 11th, 2023? Now, the question is, you know, these 300 foxes, I mean, we have these two messages, these first fruit offerings, Collins and Odilio's. Three twenty-three twenty-three is Amir, Angela says. It's interesting. Three, two, three, two, three, three, two, three, two, three. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things that that I've pointed out with Colin's presentation from the beginning and Odilio's. So just to be very plain, the problem I have with Odilio is that he's a conspiracy theorist. That is, he now he doesn't necessarily like when he took that letter there of um, Albert Pike's, you know, from August 15th, uh, 18, 1871 which is a fake letter, right? I mean, Adilio didn't really care whether the letter's real or not. He was just using it as, as a symbol, right? Um, because I don't believe he actually believes that's an, a real letter, but I could be wrong uh, because it's, it's well proven that it's fake. Never showed up until mid 20th century. And uh, it's got anachronisms like talking about Zionism before it's even a word. So, um, so it's not likely that it's it's real. Plus, talks about the First and Second World War before they happened, and you know, of course, the people would use that as well. These are planned wars and so forth. But we know that God sits enthroned above all these things. Man isn't really in control. Man would much rather do things differently than they've unfolded, as far as um, you know, any sort of satanic organization. But but be that as it may. You know, Dilly has lots of different conspiracy theories. And that's something that I believe has to get out of our message because it doesn't follow Miller's rules. Why, why do conspiracy theories not follow Miller's rules? Can anybody give me uh, an explanation why? Conspiracies exist, right? But a conspiracy theory is something that's unprovable by its very nature and also impossible to refute because any information that tries to refute it is automatically discounted by the conspiracy itself. So why does it not follow Miller's rules, conspiracy theories? Unless you disagree with me. I, I I agree with you. I just don't I just don't know what what you're trying to say. Okay, well, we have Miller's rules on how to study God's word. Now, conspiracy theories, one is are speculative in nature. They can't be established or proven. They're not solid like studying God's word. You know, everything Odilio presented was correct, the chronology, all these different symbols. But then he attaches it to conspiracy theories. He did the same thing with when he did his study on um, uh, Nero, 
right? We can see all the symbols there, but then he wants to have these conspiracy theories attached to it. And, and we're saying that you, you can't really do that. I don't like conspiracy theories because they're not taken in the right form. Yeah, well, Iran says Miller's rules require evidence, right? That is, we need things that are founded on provable facts and realities. Now, conspiracies exist. And, and sometimes the conspiracy theories that we have are true, at least partly true. That is, there's a truth to them. But they have a great deal to them that cannot be proven. And for a Christian to believe them just because they fit in with your thinking and ideas is unsafe. It's not a safe thing to do. But now, they also are basing them on facts. It depends what, how you're looking at it. Yeah, well, part of the things is they're, they're rather open to interpretation. So I've been familiar with conspiracy theories, uh, you know, especially the stuff dealing with, uh, you know, the Holocaust um, since I was a kid at a, a friend, very smart guy, um, but he believed uh, in all kinds of conspiracy theories. And um, these things were just unprovable. And they went against, really, many of these go against things that are facts. Now, what they would say is that those facts aren't really facts, they're just created. But if you live in that world where you can't prove anything, that anything that happened, you can't even prove that it occurred, uh, you're on the sea of speculation. You, you can be tossed to and fro. It's not something that's solid. Does it mean that some of these things that people come up with in their conspiracy theories don't have some basis in truth? Because they do. We could see that with uh, you know, some of the things that have happened recently, which I'm not going to name. You know, some of these details have shown to be Correct, you know, and you have to be careful what you say, right? You, so, you, can, you can also see it in JFK. Well, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. But anyway, I know most people believe that uh, conspiracy, I don't. But anyway, um, and, and you can have, like, to me, one of the classic examples of a conspiracy theory that's not true is that Paul McCartney is dead, something I studied heavily into. I used to be a, a really into the Beatles. And if you look into it, all of the evidence that the conspiracy theories present is that Paul McCartney is dead and died in, you know, 1967, right? I mean, if you look at it, it's extremely convincing, except that Paul McCartney didn't die. So you can, you can manufacture a conspiracy theory that looks very convincing if you ignore facts, but God's word does not ignore reality. It's based on reality. So it's like a lot of the biblical chronologies that I've read over the last 20, 20 years or so. They have all kinds of evidence to prove different things, except that they ignore the facts that are provable. Right? So, so, that's the problem with conspiracy theories is they ignore evidence. It's not so much that they don't have evidence. They ignore barefaced facts. Now, we're going to have to finish here. But with Collins, the problem is in conspiracy theories. What's the problem with Collins study? So they, they both have problems, even though they're true. What's the problem with Collins study? Because his study seems to be more Miller's rules on the face of it, right? He doesn't have conspiracy theories attached to it. I reckon he's trying to mix little with the spiritual. Okay. okay. So, well, one of the things we would say is that there's, there is, because he has some amazing things that God showed him, which I believe God showed him for a purpose. Um, that we need to examine. But the, the big problem is that um, we have time setting. So that's one of the things, 
right? So he is time setting or was time setting, even though he claims he's not time setting. So we have time there. And, and what he tries to do is not set the actual date. He doesn't do the logical conclusion with his structure and put January 11th, 2023 there. He doesn't do that. Um, but he's really ignoring all the light that came from July 18th regarding what dates mean. See, so I can put a date like April 5th and see, people can say I'm time setting, right? They say, well, you put April 5th there, that's a date in the future. And so you must be time setting. But we know that we can't, we don't have any event attached to it. It's a date in the future. It could be just completely symbolic. But Colin wasn't doing that. Now he was taking the dates, of course, of the election and things like that, of things in the past, the date, he wouldn't put the date in the future, but he was telling us events that were supposed to happen under a certain constraint that he had set up, that Trump was going to be made president after this election, that there would be this um, running of the table of, of the election for the Republicans, which didn't happen. And really, in some senses, things didn't really change, a little bit changed, but not enough to get any sort of impeachment of, of you know, um, Biden and Harris or anything like that. None of these scenarios panned out. But also, it was just really ignoring the fact of what our lines mean, because we have these lines and they're, they're extremely powerful, what's been shown to us. So God has to bring us to this upper room. This, these false ideas have to be destroyed. And that's only going to be destroyed by God bringing us into unity. It's not going to come about by me badgering people with, you know, my views and ideas. God's going to have to change us in order for this to happen. So we're going to look at this again. Uh, so if, if I say from Luke chapter one, and I got 2023 with the Holy Spirit's coming. So you're going to have that upper room experience. So is that time setting? Yeah, we, we don't, we're not putting any time constraints on what God's doing. Yeah, so we're not going to be, like even the January 11th date, it's a date given us from Colin and we've shown how it connects to a date that was already given, April 5th, 2030, which, you know, comes from, all, ties all of these stories together. Um, but doesn't God say he's going to give us the time? Well, we measure the time, and after the time, then we can see that it was the time. Ellen White is very clear that there will never again be a message based upon time. God is not going to give us a message of, of any event of special significance. So we're not going to know in advance any event of special significance. Well, Theodore, Collins would, Collins would disagree with you on that date because I had a discussion with him about that January. I know, I know. I've already told you this. I've, yeah. I've told you this. You've had this conversation with me. Colin yeah. does not set that date. Which yeah. very, we're very clear, but he should have. But yeah. I think God revealed his, his mystery. Well, we got to finish here. So, so I got to go. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this evening. Uh, we just ask that you can help us um, as we study this personally to understand these things. When we come together tomorrow, Lord, we ask that your spirit um, can help us to think clearly, um, to understand and to remember the things that we have studied and to address these issues that um, uh, we need to resolve within ourselves. Be, be with each person. Um, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.